President Reagan had ordered the US Navy to begin flying patrols over the disputed Gulf of Sidra in the Mediterranean, claimed as territorial waters by Libya and as international seas by the US. And on August the 19th, two Libyan fighter jets were shot down by American Navy jets. The incident coming as part of an increasing escalation in the US-Libyan tensions would be the basis for parts of the movie Top Gun. The long-running and complex civil war in Angola saw an escalation with the intervention of South African soldiers. The Angolan communist rebels were also supporting Namibian independence organisations who were fighting their own insurgency against South African occupation. In Tokyo, Sony launched the Mavica, the magical video camera, which stored analogue images on removable discs rather than films. It was the world's first electronic camera and paved the way for digital cameras a decade later. On the 19th of August, Sebastian Coe broke Steve Ovet's world record for running one mile. On the 26th of August, Ovet took the record back, and then on 29th of August, Coe took it back again. The pair had knocked two seconds off the record between them in nine days, and Coe's record set on the 29th of August, would stand until broken by Steve Cram in 1985. Two men from a militant Palestinian group attacked a synagogue in central Vienna with guns and grenades during worship. Nobody in the synagogue was hurt, but two bystanders were killed and 15 injured in the ensuing shootout with the Austrian police. The F1 circus, meanwhile, headed north from the alpine foothills of Austria to the sand dunes of the Dutch coast. The Zandvoort circuit was another high-speed circuit that might be expected to benefit the turbo cars, but was notorious for its slippery surface, with sand from the dunes blowing across the track, a characteristic that often proved a wild card. The Fittipaldi team were back with engines once more, while journalists and commentators had become increasingly vocal about the farce of the ground clearance regulations. At the start of the season, a rule mandating a 6 centimetre ground clearance had been introduced, but early on, Brabham had introduced a suspension system that lowered the car onto the track when racing, but raised it at the flip of a switch to pass the scrutineer check. Everybody quickly copied the system, so Fieser decided not to push the issue and turn a blind eye. The end result was a pantomime of checking ride heights while teams seemed to spend just as long replacing the worn rubber skirts on the chassis, which weren't supposed to be touching the ground, as they did practising and qualifying. Aside from the farcical aspect, it also meant that the restrictions, which were intended to make the cars safer by lowering cornering speeds, were being circumvented. Patrick Head opined to Dennis Jenkinson of Motorsport magazine that nothing would change until either the drivers collectively refused to drive or a nasty accident could be obviously traced to the trick suspension systems. Siegfried Stohr, who had never really gotten over the accident in Belgium, had announced that he would be quitting driving F1 after his home race at Monza, so there was some speculation about potential replacements for the final two rounds of the season. Most likely Jan Lammers, thought the pundits. For further in the future, Ricardo Patrese was hotly tipped to be joining Brabham in place of Rebecca next year. Both Renault drivers had renewed their contracts for 1982, but neither of the top championship contenders, Piquet and Reutemann, had yet put pen to paper all of which proved to be rather more entertaining than qualifying itself, which proved fairly predictable in terms of the front, with Prost and Arnoux once again filling the first two spaces. P.K., Jones, Reutemann and Lafitte were the next four, with Mario Andretti reaching the dizzy heights, in 1981 terms, of seventh. Watson, De Angelis and Patrese made up the top ten, Pironi crashed his Ferrari and could only manage twelfth, Villeneuve didn't and was down in sixteenth. Once again, Jarier qualified well in 18th and Gabbiani didn't qualify at all, and neither did the struggling Fittipaldis, the frustrated Tolmans and Michele Alboreto. Andrea de Cesaris maintained his record by demolishing his 21st chassis of the year in qualifying, and this seemed to be the last straw for Ron Dennis and Teddy Mayer. Citing that they couldn't rebuild the car in time, and that the spare car was reserved for Watson, they withdrew his entry, and Michele Alboreto was bumped up to the grid, though oddly De Cesaris's place was left empty rather than shuffling everyone else up a place. Sunday dawned mild and cool, and the morning's warm-up saw Reutemann and Piquet set the best times, with the best turbo car down in fourth, so there were hopes for an even race as the cars lined up for the start. When the lights went green, the two Renaults got away well, with Piquet and Jones duking it out into the Tarzan hairpin, but further back Gilles Villeneuve clipped the back of Giacomelli's Alfa Romeo, bounced, and then pirouetted gracefully off the track, somehow managing not to collect half a dozen other cars in the process. Prost immediately began to pull away from Arnoux, who had Jones, Piquet and Lafitte all breathing down his and each other's necks. 
Further back, Pironi and Tombe both came into the pits at the end of the first lap, the former with front suspension damage, the latter with rear suspension damage, which told its own story. The Ligier team retired Tombe on the spot, the Ferrari boys sent Peroni out again, but after a few laps it was obvious that the car just wasn't working and he retired. Short afternoon for the prancing horse. Jones passed Arnoux without too much effort at the start of lap three and set off in pursuit of Prost, while Piquet now began to attack the Renault and got past in the same place as Jones, on the start-finish straight the following lap. Lafitte took a little longer, but soon he and Reutemann were past two, and Arnoux is now having trouble keeping John Watson's McLaren behind him. Renault had opted to start Prost on softer tyres and Arnoux on harder ones, slower but more durable, and he was obviously suffering from that decision now. After 15 laps, Jones was less than a second behind Prost, and four ahead of Piquet. The lafitte Reutemann pairing was about eight seconds behind the Brabham, with Watson, now past Arnoux, another five further back. After another couple of laps, Jones was right up with Prost and pulled out on the start-finish straight. The cars ran side by side down the straight and into the Tarzan hairpin, but Prost held the lead. Meanwhile, Reutemann had had a bit of a brain fade and gone for a non-existent gap, colliding with Lafitte and putting the pair of them out. Bravely and stupidly, Lafitte dashed back onto the track to pick up a bit of car before someone ran over it and did themselves a mischief. The rules are pretty clear about no one being allowed to cross the track during a race, but drivers and marshals alike do it all the time, all of which promoted Watson to fourth, Arnoux to fifth, and Hector Rebecca to a somewhat distant sixth. Jones, meanwhile, gathered himself for another go at Prost, tried a couple of times going into Tarzan without making it stick, but got his chance at the last corner when Prost made a meal of lapping Alboreto's Tyrrell. It wasn't to last, though. The little Frenchman got on the power down the straight, got the inside line into Tarzan, and retook the lead. Arnoux's engine gave out on lap 22, ending his miserable race, and soon Jones was dropping back from Prost, his tyres beginning to go off. After that, the race sort of fizzled out somewhat. Andretti had a big off on lap 63. Piquet gradually closed up on Jones and took second with eight laps to go. Watson and Cheever both disappeared from points-paying positions with technical gremlins, and Eliseo Salazar fought his way past the man he'd replaced at Ensign, Mark Sura. And that was that. Alain Prost took a dominant lights-to-flag win, with the exception of that brief lead by Jones, with PK second and Jones third. Hector Rebacco took a well-deserved fourth, with DeAngelis fifth, and Eliseo Salazar picking up his first career point in sixth. Michele Alboreto had been cruising to that final point, but broke down with a lap to go and was classified ninth. Siegfried Storr claimed his best result of the season in 7th with Borgud and Sura, the other survivors. With three races to go, the World Championship was wide open with seven men still mathematically in contention and PK now equal on points with Reutemann at the top. 